Hello and welcome back to the Stubborn Book Podcast. This is Bernadette. So here we go again. This is episode five and we are doing chapter three. This chapter revolves around the story of two brothers who don't think they can work together anymore. We talk about a person's duplicity, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of a person. What we can do about it and that's where the phrase 4-H for adults comes into play. What, what does that mean? Well, let's have a listen right now. If you want this same sign on your farm, please give us a holler at 1-800-474-2057 and we'll be happy to mail one to you. Again, that's 1-800-474-2057. Chapter 3. Left Hand. Stop pointing fingers and focus on the three pointing back. When John called me out to his farm over the phone, he said, We have problems working together. Can you come and help us? But after our private meeting at his kitchen table earlier that morning, it was obvious that he felt that all the problems were his brother's, not his. The way that John described his older brother, Gerald, you would think he was describing Hitler. Gerald was a classic narcissist who had high expectations about what needed to be done, and when it wasn't done his way, he had anger management issues. John said, There is no doubt in anyone's mind that Gerald isn't hardworking. He is just hard to work with. His wife sat beside her husband, nodding in agreement and interjecting a word here and there. In meeting with Gerald an hour later, he described John to me as being lazy and unreliable. He was fine during the busy times of the year, like spring planting or fall harvest but there would be days in the middle of summer and months in the winter where he'd show up to work but get nothing done. He would spend half the day socializing with employees and salesmen, having accomplished very little beyond basic chores by day's end. He'd start projects but not finish them and was always behind with critical tasks. When it came time to drive equipment into the field, he'd still be doing basic machinery maintenance like changing the oil, which could have been done in February. Their crops were always late getting in and always yielded less than the neighbors as a result. They didn't get the yields and had to buy feed, which really impacted their dairy farm's bottom line. John simply had no concept of the value of time and had no accountability. This drove Gerald nuts, and Gerald said to me more than twice, John is just riding on my coattails. Both men had faults, and both men had ample reasons to be frustrated with each other, but both were good guys. They just both had faults that were holding them back from realizing their fullest potential. After John spent 45 minutes telling me the many problems he had in working with his brother, I asked him, what is it like farming with your brother on a good day? He looked at me sharply like a deer caught in the headlights. For about 30 seconds, he refused to give any compliments, and getting him to give even a superficial compliment was like drawing blood from a stone. But I pressed him, and to my surprise, John just broke down sobbing not a silent tear. He broke down hard and sounded like a toddler wailing. Eventually, he said between the sobs that, on a good day, it is a good day, but the problem is that they have become too rare lately. His wife looked at me and muttered under her breath that I've never seen him cry before, except at his dad's funeral. She was shocked. What was obvious was that although the two brothers were at odds with each other, they were also best friends who deeply cared for each other and that is what made it so hard to deal with the idea of splitting up. John felt such huge sorrow because when he woke up every morning, he didn't know which version of Gerald was going to show up to work, Dr. Jekyll, the hero, or Mr. Hyde, the monster. Nobody wants to work with a jerk. Nobody wants to work with a partner who isn't giving it their all. Nobody wants to work with a partner who has the potential to be better, yet doesn't make the effort. This is the silent truth that causes friction in family businesses and literally has partners crying buckets when they finally bring it out of the closet. Nobody is fully aware of all their faults, but we all know of pet peeves that drive our business partners, let alone our spouses, crazy. Yet we choose to ignore them. Our attitude is, you're stuck with me, deal with it. This entitlement is how partnerships and marriages fail. It doesn't matter who you are, everyone has a dark side. Even the most pious, well-liked man or woman in your community has 5% of their character that is undesirable and hard to tolerate. You wouldn't be either married or involved with a family business if you only saw the dark side in a family business partner. 
You marry Dr. Jekyll or the hero you see in a person. However, every day across America, business partnerships and marriages are falling apart because the dark side of their partners comes out more days than can be tolerated, which is the wrong type of consistency. Is divorce the answer? In those two private morning meetings that I had with each brother and their wife, they all said that they wanted to work things out and improve the nature of the farming partnership. However, that afternoon, when I sat down with the two couples and their mother to mediate the situation, things went off the rails within minutes. As I sat there opposite the mother at one end of the table and the two couples opposite each other on both sides, I could see a stark fear seep into everyone's minds, causing tempers to flare. This business wasn't just their livelihood. It was everything to them ranging from where they lived to family relationships. They fought with each other as if someone was coming to kidnap their child. The farm was everything to them. The words that were coming out of the sisters-in-law's mouths were vicious and completely out of character. Everyone got defensive and accusations for past mistakes started getting thrown around. I tried to get everyone to focus on one issue at a time, but everyone continued to deflect and bring up unrelated past grievances. It was obvious that they didn't have me out there to problem solve some issues or improve how they worked together as a team. They had me out there to get a divorce. Brother from brother and sister-in-law from sister-in-law, they had me out to the farm to act as a judge as to who was in the right. Like so many past farms I had worked with, I felt I was in divorce court yet again. It wasn't long before I had realized something disturbing about that analogy to divorce and the breaking up of business partnerships. I had recently found out the statistical fact that many couples who go to see a marriage counselor end up in a divorce within four years after. I was very shocked by this. Most couples don't go to a counselor to learn from past mistakes, realize what they did wrong, and improve themselves. They go to the counselor for a moment of vengeance and redemption. They go to the counseling session to complain to the counselor about their partner's behavior and to get the counselor to take their side. Their hope is that the counselor will tell their partner in a different way what their partner is doing wrong and get them to change their behavior. They hope that their partner will realize their errors in the past and ask for forgiveness. They go to the session with the counselor for the purpose of pushing their perspective onto their partner, not to learn their partner's perspective and to learn about what they can do to improve themselves. If their partner didn't change their behavior because of the counselor's suggestions, then the next step would be divorce. I realized this is what my mediation attempts were turning into. I had been doing mediation for several years up to this moment with dozens of farm families, and to be perfectly honest, I was slowly getting burnt out. I was becoming more and more frustrated with how often I'd sit down with stubborn partners who told me they wanted to work things out, but it would turn into a fight where I'd become the judge in a blame game. Not just any judge either, but a divorce court judge. I knew that was not what my life's mission was about. The thought of throwing in the towel crossed my mind at that table as I felt my whole profession was futile. What about 4-H for adults? Exasperated by the situation, I turned toward the window only to see the eldest grandson in the front yard. I was told he was going to be the fifth generation to farm and remembered how highly John spoke about this kid. John didn't have much good to say about his brother Gerald. But for his nephew, Levi, he had only kind words to say. John was really impressed that Levi got out of bed every morning at 4 a.m. to milk cows before he got on the school bus. That kid lives to farm, he said. Levi was roughly 16, and he was leading his 4-H calf in the farmyard, just outside the kitchen window. The calf was being stubborn like a mule, but Levi wasn't giving in, pulling on the calf halter to get the calf to lead. For those of you who don't know, 4-H is a community service club focused on youth development. You probably have seen farm kids showing cattle and horses at your state fair. As referenced earlier in this book, the 4-H motto is learn to do by doing and is all about learning practical skills through projects, many of them working with animals. It takes a lot of work to train a cow to walk on what is essentially a dog leash and to groom a sow until she looks pretty. It takes dedication and overcoming challenges to do this, but more importantly, it is about becoming a better person through the challenges that hard work puts in front of a kid. I thought it ironic that the farm was bringing out the best in the kid, yet that meeting in the kitchen was bringing out the worst in his parents. Why? His parents were being the wrong type of stubborn. 
Almost every farmer I've met in the 16 long years I've been doing what I do is some guy or gal I'd love to sit at a kitchen table and share a pie with. But I also know that no one is perfect. There is no perfect farmer out there. Everyone has 5% of their character or performance that, if tweaked, could solve more than 50% of their issues. And for a business, fixing those 50% of issues can quickly lead to doubling their business's profitability and make working with family fun again. Yes, Levi's parents and his aunt and uncle were good people, but they allowed their stubbornness to become a wedge between them. None of them would budge in admitting that they had played any part in the problems on the farm. Everyone was viciously defending themselves, pointing fingers, and trying to shift blame onto their partners. This stubbornness grew into destructive habits that were all coming out that day. Everyone was talking over each other. Nobody was listening. They were all obsessed with being right rather than making things right. They failed to address business or production problems because no one wanted to admit to any fault in their area of responsibility. Instead, they tended to double down on bad decisions leading to money slipping between the cracks right under their noses. Everything from day-to-day -day operations to long-term strategy was in limbo because no one wanted to get in the same room together to discuss anything or be told what to do by their partners. Respect for each other had long flown the coop, making it a very toxic environment for everyone, including employees who were quitting left and right due to the drama. How ironic is it that we encourage our farm kids to be in 4-H for the purpose of self-improvement? Yet once we are past the age of eligibility to be in 4-H, we pretend we are perfect and refuse to change? How is it that a farm creates such good character in a kid, yet too often for farmers, it brings out the worst in adults on the farm? In baseball, major league athletes who get drafted as an amateur and stay in their professional leagues for long careers do so not just based on natural talent, but their ability to recognize faults, be coached, and self-improve. It's the same with business. Whether you are playing below the amateur level or as an all-star professional depends on what type of stubborn you are. Whether you blame your inabilities on others by being stubborn at taking advice or you learn to listen to advice and self-improve dictates the difference between success and failure. In sports, what dictates a team's success isn't luck. It is the ability of the team to be the best version of themselves by being stubborn at self-improvement throughout the year. This family at the kitchen table was a devout Christian farm family who read the Bible together after each meal. Their Bible was on the kitchen table. It was open to Matthew 7, 5, where the words of Jesus were written in red, You hypocrite! First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It doesn't matter if you are Catholic, Protestant, Atheist, Buddhist, or if you believe Elvis is still alive. These are profound words that can change any family business. You can't control the actions of others, but you can control your own actions. And it's only when you focus on changing your behavior that you get positive changes in your life. In that moment of seeing the kid leading his 4-H calf and glancing over at Matthew 7-5, a lot of things clicked all at once. What would happen if we simply worked on one fault at a time? What would happen if instead of denying it and shifting blame, each partner leaned into their weaknesses and worked diligently over a month to replace it with a better habit? Instead of pointing fingers, focus on the three fingers pointing back at you and fix yourself first. What would happen if every month each partner identified one bad habit that they have in working together with teammates and turned it from a weakness into a strength? I believe that for every challenge you have in life, you either have an incorrect belief a character flaw, or a skill deficiency. Or in other words, you have bad habits or weaknesses that need to be turned into good habits and become your strengths. Either you rise above the challenge and learn a valuable lesson to self-improve, or it causes you and your team to self-destruct. You aren't in control of another's actions, but you are in control of your own actions. And it's only when you take personal responsibility to change what you can change not what others can change, that your family, business, marriage, or personal life will change for the better. The big question. If everyone within your partnership picked out one bad habit each month and worked on turning it from a personal weakness into a strength over 30 days, and then your team collectively identified one bad habit that everyone has in common each month, and together as a team you work on turning that bad habit from a weakness into a strength, how much different would your business partnership be in 12 months? Think about that.